Half a day and good afternoon, everyone. Joining us today for this press conference are Sen is Senator Chris Duaneus, the co-sponsor of this bill, Senator uh, Pastor Kevin Elwell of the Guam Ministerial Association, thank you, Pastor Kevin, and Ms. Bethany Taylor, the Executive Director of Harvest House, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to also introduce uh, Mr. Peter Scro, who assisted us in drafting this bill. Again, thank all of, I want to thank all of you for being present today to show your support um, for the Guam Heartbeat Act. Being here today for this introduction of Bill Number 291-36LS, the Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022. Since I first ran for senator, our island's people have approached me every single term and asked me to introduce a bill that protects life. They said to me, Senator, we need to protect the right to live for the unborn. Senator, please do this for the unborn. No one will ever do this. And it has been a challenging road. But today, we stand here and I would like to express my sincerest apologies for the amount of time it has taken to introduce this bill. This is my third term in the Guam legislature, but this term, we finally did it. My stance has always been for the protection of life. And with the support from many, like all of you here today, we continue to fight for it. We are all here today to protect the sanctity of life. Many may know I was repeatedly told that this isn't the right time and this is political suicide. Well, I realized it will never be the right time. And I never ran for senator to serve myself. I made a commitment to be the voice of the people and to take concrete action to do whatever it takes to protect our island and her people. Even if that means pushing forward with the controversial thing. Throughout the development of this bill, until right before this press conference, we received pushback from other leaders who attempted to persuade me to refrain from introducing the Guam Heartbeat Act. However, throughout, three, throughout my three terms as senator, we have heard and continue to hear an outcry from various groups in our island's community to take the step in protecting the unborn, to give them their fighting chance at life. Women and men from all walks of life, from different ages, from different values and different religions, repeatedly has asked for a bill to protect our most vulnerable. Together, we introduced the Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022. And with deep respect and love, I kindly ask our community, the media, and most especially our government's leaders who will vote on this bill to please take some time for reflection and prayer and to refrain from building narratives of controversy, division, or the disempowering of women's rights. This bill does not set out to disempower or divide. The Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022 was created for one reason and one reason only. It is a bill to protect, to protect our most vulnerable, 
and give every single human with a heartbeat the fighting chance to live a life, to be able to breathe, to live freely, and experience the opportunity to be on this earth like all of us here today. May we be reminded that we are standing in this room or listening to this or doing whatever you are doing in this moment because a woman with rights gave you the chance to live. You are here because a woman, your mother, chose life. The Guam Heartbeat Act is a bill modeled after the Texas Heartbeat Law. This act seeks to ban abortions when a heartbeat is detected during a sonogram or ultrasound. If an abortion is performed after a heartbeat is detected, the act will allow private citizens to file a lawsuit with the Superior Court of Guam or the District Court of Guam against any person who performs or induces the abortion with a minimum amount of statutory damages of $10,000. However, it does not allow any government official or any employee to file a lawsuit. And it does not allow for mothers to be sued for having an abortion. The only exception stated in the act in which someone can perform an abortion is when a mother's health may be compromised or if her life is at risk due to the pregnancy. When we first set out to develop the Guam Heartbeat Act, we considered the choices available for the women in our community. We didn't just throw a bill out. We wanted to ensure that every woman has the resources she needs if she is not able to be with and raise her child or has made the decision not to raise her child due to circumstances. There are many groups in our com community, many people who for decades have been providing support for women and unwanted children. They continue to do this unwaveringly and offer such support. Organizations who provide these service for our island's women and children include Safe Haven, Harvest House Guam, Catholic Social Services, Ali's Women's Shelter, Healing Hearts, and victim advocates reaching out to name a small few. We will hear from one of these hardworking groups today and from other individuals who advocate for this cause. Now, is the time to amplify their efforts and offer support to those organizations as well. I now, I'd now like to invite Senator Duenas to speak. Sijasmasi, Senator Nelson, and is it truly an honor and a privilege to have been selected to be your co-sponsor. Um, I wanna tell the people of Guam that uh, when I was first given a chance to serve the, them again, one of the first things when I was elected, I met Senator Nelson and she said, Senator, I have to talk to you. And I said, sure. She said, I need your help. I'm gonna introduce the heartbeat bill. She's true to her word. She's done it. And she's given a lot of thought to this. And there's been a lot of strong advocacy in terms of the legal draftsmanship. And you know, even in this term, We've passed bills to strengthen adoption opportunities. We've done things to try to make sure that we can do everything possible to allow an expectant mother to have an opportunity, even if for some reason circumstances are so terrible that they cannot have that child after its birth, that we would put laws in place and work with nonprofits and work with others to make sure that that child of God can have an opportunity to see the life that it deserves. Senator Nelson is a tough woman. I've known some tough women in my life. She's a strong woman, and she's gonna see this through with prayer, with your help, and with everyone else's help 
in terms of this journey that we have going forward. Now, I know we have a few pastors in this room and they've used this term. I've even heard my priest say it a few times. God has a sense of humor. <laughs> because this bill is 291-36. I think you've heard of a resolution called 291-36. <laughs> That's for a different time. That's about our freedoms as well. <laughs> this is about the freedom the freedom of the unborn. I'm so proud to be able to be a co-sponsor of this. It's a responsible bill. It's a bill that's vetted. It's a bill that has durability. It's a bill that has proven uh, to withstand even Supreme Court, um, you know, motions. And so we're thankful for you being here today. You know, as I close one thing I expect in this hall, and you can expect to hear, because other measures that I have supported in the past, Senator Dennis Rodriguez has introduced bills for informed consent, Senator Frank Uggen Jr. And even on those bills that don't go to the extent that we're doing today, there was so much pushback. And one of the things that people would come, and I'm, I was amazed, these are even leaders, that will come down and stand in front of you and say, you know, what are you doing about the children that we have right now? We have children we need to help. What's the matter with you? And you know, as I went and prayed and thought about that, because I know we have a lot to do. We all have a lot to do. But as I went and thought and I prayed about that, you know what came to my mind? And I'm glad God made this come to my mind. Maybe it's because we don't care about that child in the womb that we've lost our way when it comes to thinking about our children and taking care of children. Maybe it was when this horrid act of aborting the unborn became a prolific thing that it changed us. It changed us as human beings. If we can kill the unborn, then yes, maybe it's easier to neglect a child. Maybe it's easier to think more about ourselves than others. I look forward to the debate. My final closing is, you know, we're, we have a war going on right now. All of our eyes are on Ukraine and the suffering and children and mothers and those who are escaping. But you know, even soldiers on the field are patching, you know, patching up their, their wounded, carrying them back on gurneys, saving their lives. We save lives of people in war. Every day you go to the emergency room, we save lives, we save lives, we save lives. This bill is about saving lives. Saving lives before they're even born. But as the author said, please pray. Please don't engage in the vitriol and the, the knives that are going to come our way. I was asked today by somebody, the governor's really angry. What do you got to say, Chris? I said, I got to say that I'm praying for her. Because God, through prayer, changes the hearts of man. With that, thank you very much, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Senator Duenas. I will now call on Pastor Kevin from the Guam Ministerial Association for his remarks. Half a day and good afternoon. I want to say I'm honored to be up here with the Two senators who have sponsored this, and I love the diversity up here. Two politicians who work in the political arena, a lawyer who's skilled in his area, and a, and a, and a mother who uh, works as an advocate for children on the island, and a pastor, an eclectic group here, uh, and it's a worthy cause. And I'm going to stick to my letter now because it's very tempting to put a microphone in front of a preacher, so... Dear Senator Nelson, 
I serve as the president of the Guam Ministerial Association. The GMA is a coalition of like-minded pastors who meet every month to support each other in our local ministries, but also strive to work together on larger projects where we can be more effective collectively. I'm writing this letter on behalf of the GMA to express our support for the Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022. As pastors, we believe in the sanctity of life and that all people have eternal value because we are made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 to 27. This includes the unborn babies in mother's wombs. The Bible records King David expounding on the depth of God's relational knowledge when he writes in Psalms 139, verses 13 to 15, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. We also see in the Bible a strong warning to those who harm children in Matthew 18, 6-7, and a special exhortation to take care of helpless children as being a sign of genuine faith in James 1, 27. As pastors, we feel that the Heartbeat Act encapsulates these divine values. It recognizes the unborn as life and values it. Supporting the act seeks to help unborn children who need an advocate. Our hope is that our Guam culture will have a better future with the passage of this act that honors, protects, and values life made in the image of God. Thank you for having the courage to put your name on a bill that addresses a controversial and contentious issue. Your work on this is a worthy cause. We want you to know that the pastoral community and the churches we represent through the GMA are immensely grateful. We stand behind your support of the Heartbeat Act. Respectfully, Pastor Kevin and the Ministerial Association. And I want to read to you the names of the pastors and the churches who have put their name on this. Abundant Life Church, Pastor Albert Aquero, Agate Community Church, uh, Shiler Brantley, Ark Ministries, Pastor Brian McGill, Bayview Church, Pastor Kevin Elwell, Guam Bible Fellowship, and By the Well Family, Pastor James Gertemag, Calvary Baptist Church, Interim Pastor Jimmy Gimmon, Calvary Chapel Guam, Pastor Rick Camacho, Castle Zion Church, Pastor Johan O, oh, Pastor Grace Heisel Nam, and Pastor Greg Barnes, Faith Presbyterian Christian Reformed Church, Pastor Jeff Nelson, First Church of God, Pastor Ron Giesen, Guam Christian Life Fellowship, Pastor Pancho Madrid, Island Hope Foursquare Church, Pastor Caesar Chrysostomo, and Pastor Anna Chrysostomo, Life in the Sun Christian Fellowship, Pastor Mark Benevente, Lutheran Church of Guam, Pastor Sean Dottery, Every Nation Church, Pastor Bradley Dunnigan, and Pastor Frank Bloss, and Church of the Nazarene, Pastor Dave Ackerman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. We will now hear from Bethany Taylor from Harvest House. Bethany. Thank you, Senator Nelson, Majority Leader of the 36th Guam Legislature, for sponsoring the Heartbeat Bill Act of 2022. A famous Greek philosopher said, courageous confidence is a sure sign of leadership and success. We as the people of Guam stand courageously with you in defending the life of the unborn and know that an injury done to the least of its citizens is an injury done to us all. My name is Bethany Taylor. I'm the executive director of Harvest House, a nonprofit to the foster community on Guam. I am supporting uh, the Guam Heartbeat Act of 2022. In the 13 years I've been a foster parent on island, I've used every opportunity to speak out on the vulnerable on our island. I plead for people to visualize the faces, the names, 
and the stories of the abused, abandoned, and neglected children on our island. I tell you of the significance of their lives and the truth that every child matters. Today, I speak out for the unborn, the most vulnerable, the ones who are truly dependent on another individual to care enough about them to allow them to survive. They too have a heartbeat that matters. They too have a future that should not be cut short because of another person's choice. Why do I care? When I got the call as a foster parent that there was a failure to thrive 18-month-old baby who was abandoned, he didn't even know how to cry. He had no energy to even sit, move, crawl. He had disfigured extremities because of rats biting him. He mattered to us. He mattered to strangers, from social workers to hospital staff to church friends to us as a foster family. Despite the horrific condition he was in, he had a heartbeat and he had a will to live. With a family to love and nourish him, he grew up to be strong and healthy, and he was given a chance. Even though he was abandoned, his life really mattered. What about my three-month-old baby who suffered abuse? He was shaken violently and had emergency brain surgery to save his life. After surgery, the doctors told the social workers, hey, this child was healthy, but because of the abuse, will now have the life of a vegetable. He's cortically blind, has multiple disabilities and seizures. Will a stranger love him? Is his life of any value? Most definitely. His life is proof that every life matters, even with trauma or disability. He had the will to live. Today, he is a strong, athletic, funny 14-year-old who is thankful that his life mattered enough for the doctors to save him and mattered enough for a family to love him. He's with me today, Devin. <laughs> Buddy. He's adopted into our family. I want to tell you what about the very young teenage girl that was a victim of sexual abuse from her own family. She became pregnant and entered foster care. It's not what she chose. It's not how her life was supposed to be. But the heartbeat of her unborn child was actually her avenue out of continued sexual abuse that could have continued throughout her entire teen years. Despite the horrific trauma she encountered at a young age, she valued the life of her baby and trusted and built a solid relationship with her foster mom to adopt the baby. What looked like hardship, what looked like an impossible scenario of true love, ended up being one of her finest moments when she witnessed the baby's heartbeat on the monitor turn to a baby's cry as a human that mattered entered this world. Some would argue that in each of these stories, the child should not have lived, that no one should have advocated for them. I believe that each life, whether born or unborn, abandoned or loved from the very beginning, has a heartbeat and value to their life. So today I stand on their behalf to let their voices be heard through me. May it never be said that we stood silent and lacked the courage to defend the most vulnerable when they needed us the most. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator Duaneus. Thank you, Pastor Kevin. And thank you, Bethany, for your testimonies. We will open the floor for questions. Um, if you have any legal questions, we have attorney Peter Scro with us here today. He has been a very huge component in allowing us to uh, draft this bill, to craft this bill, and to work with the community. Um, so thank you, Mr. Scro, for okay. being here today and joining us. We won't be open for too long. We do have to uh, end by 2.30, so we'll get as much as we can. Can you turn on your mic, please? Thank you. Hannah Devonzo, representing KUAM News. My question for you, Senator, is currently there is no abortion clinic on island, so how will this be exactly applicable to Guam? You know, we know that um, there have been strong efforts to recruit abortion doctors. Uh, we know that there is a community out there that continues to believe that abortion should exist. You know, sometimes laws are designed to prevent uh, things, you know, and, and I think the most important thing is this is the conscience of our, commu our community. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think what happened really over time when, uh, when uh, you know, abortion doctors started leaving the island and, and, and we had a tough time getting them here is because our community has been speaking out. The faith community and other communities have been speaking out saying that this is wrong. And, and, and even I think that it, it has become very difficult, even, even politically, I think, currently under the current administration to, to get this, you know, um, you know, up and running again in terms of that ability. Hannah, though, there is issues with regard to, um, you know, even uh, um, abortions through medication and different things. We had to fight telemedicine bills and other things that were trying to come to, you know, to kind of use loopholes in our law. So, I think it's important, whether it's ha happening right now or not happening right now, I think the most important thing is to us to have a law in place to ensure that, um, that, you know, that, that we speak, and we speak with one voice that abortion is not acceptable or is not something that our community wants to have, and particularly when a heartbeat is detected. So I, I would say that uh, this bill is important regardless of what the current activity is. Thank you, and my last question. Oh, Excuse me, can I, I, I think I can help answer your question from, um, there is actually a practical reason of my explanation, but there's a legal reason. Um, let's just assume there's been no abortions on Guam for the past two years. It, it really doesn't make a difference. And the reason I'm saying that is the nation is in a state of flux right now. We have two United States Supreme Court decisions that are, have already upheld the Texas Heartbeat Act. Just three weeks ago, the United States uh, Supreme Court of Texas upheld the Heartbeat Act. There are currently 28 states that are enacting their own Heartbeat Acts. Now, what's important to consider is, as far as the, as far as the Texas Heartbeat Act before the Supreme Court, the court is actually perplexed. They're, they're not looking at it as a direct attack on Roe versus Wade. Um, it's, it's, it's the way it's worded, but what the court is gonna decide come July is that instead of the federal government having the right to, to basically regulate abortion, it now becomes the right of the states and the territories. So that's why everybody's rushing, because they want to have in place those acts, just like we want to have in place this act, before the Supreme Court makes that decision. I, I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. And my last question for you, Senator, is how has the response been from your colleagues in the legislature regarding this bill? I believe um, many feel compelled to, to support the bill. Uh, many, feel, many feel compelled to fight to protect life. The challenge is that um, it's just a matter of trusting in the Lord and having courage. We have, a, we have other co-sponsors as well. We have Senator Ada, Senator Frank Blass Jr., um, I believe, Amanda and Amanda Shelton. And the reason why we wanted to be here today is we, we worked on this together from the beginning, constructing it, and, and we, you know, we knew we'd be pressed for time. Um, any, anyone else? Sponsor? 
Okay, yeah. So those are the other uh, three sponsors. So right now we have five sponsors, which is actually one third of the legislature. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're there. I think we can compel our other colleagues uh, to come on board. And I think you, you see by the folks we have here today, I think there's going to be a lot of, of um, information sharing to try to get their support. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Althea Engman with the Pacific News Center. My question is, according to the bill and research, on average it takes about five and a half to six weeks to identify a heartbeat. On average, it takes women about four to seven weeks to figure out if they are pregnant or not. If this bill does pass, will it give women enough time to make a decision on whether or not, or they will, abort the child safely in a safety procedure? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so it takes about four to seven weeks for women to figure out whether or not they are pregnant. And it takes about five and a half to six weeks to, fi um, to find a heartbeat. Now, will this give enough time for women to figure out if they want to abort or not abort in a safely manner? This bill says that if the child has a heartbeat, you, you cannot abort it because that is the beginning of life. Just like when your heartbeat stops, determines your death. When your heartbeat begins, it is the beginning of life. I think the main thing is the understanding that, you know, the, the law is in place, right? I mean, there are definitions. There are clear definitions in the law in terms of uh, using uh, medical terms. Uh, and, and so, of course, it used menstrual cycle and the like to, to know that, that time, when that timeline is. I mean, I... I I don't want to intrude on, of course, uh, you know, a place that I shouldn't be, but to, only to answer your question is very clear in there in terms of the medical terms and the description. I think that those contemplating, um, you know, an unwanted pregnancy uh, will be aware of the law, and I think that, you know, they'll understand. But the thing is, the onus is going to be on medical delivery, right? That's, that's where the rubber hits the road. I mean, a, a physician, anybody who would, would engage in this practice or want to or continue to engage in this practice, they will be the ones to make sure that the notification is there that uh, I cannot perform this procedure once we have a detection of a heartbeat. I hope that answers your, helps to answer your question. Thank you. Can we call on the next uh, individual so we can, I know we're past our time. Is there one more question? Uh, for Ms. Taylor, um, how is that uh, young woman and her baby doing now? If you know the answer to that. Um, she is doing very well. She's in a safe and loving home and still stands by her decision today and allowed me to use her story. Thank you. May I ask one more question for uh, Attorney Scro? Attorney Scro, um, I noticed that the bill, I have a copy of the bill, uh, takes, uh, takes away the power of the government to, um, I guess, file for relief against an abortion provider uh, or crime, criminal charges, uh, the governor, the AG senators, any agency or employees of the government uh, cannot file any civil lawsuit. Why is that? The reason for that is, uh, I'm gonna try to keep this very simple. It all has to do with the Constitution and the Organic Act. The Constitution, it's often confused among not just people within our own community, but throughout the nation. The Constitution, for example, Troy, doesn't protect me from you. It doesn't protect people from people. It protects people from government action. So when you remove government, there can't be a constitutional challenge. So that is why the United States Supreme Court has not found reason to say that this conflicts with Roe versus Wade. That's why they have, they could have very easy on both hearings said this is unconstitutional but they could not find any government action. So because there's no government action, there is no constitutional violation. Right. Senator, I have one more question, but I, I'll yield to him. And if there's any time, then I'd like to ask. Okay, we're gonna close now. We want to thank everyone for being here today. Senator, do you have time for two more questions, please? Go on, just, Post, just, John Connor. Okay, just one more, John. Because okay. we're over time. We can definitely talk to you after. Well, but if you case, have a question, then, please proceed. I with think it. I'll ask this question. 
Can you explain the, uh, ex the scope of the civil liabilities? It, it seems very broad. This is the uh, section 91B108, section A2. It says you can bring a civil action against anyone who knowingly engages in conduct that aids or bets the performance of an abortion. That seems like it includes insurance companies, but it can also include someone who buys a plane ticket for someone to get an abortion off island or maybe drive someone to a clinic. Can you explain the scope of this section and give specific examples? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really couldn't hear the question. I was, I was trying to, but I couldn't, couldn't hear it and I want to answer it correctly. The scope of civil liability for violations, aiding and abetting. What is the scope here? Because it seems like it can affect people who just drive people to a clinic or buy plane tickets for people to get abortions off island. So what is the scope? Can you provide specific examples? Basically, the, the scope was intended to be very broad. The, the scope, uh, it's important to note that when you read the scope, that excluded from the scope is there is no liability exposure at all to the woman that has chosen to have an abortion. But, and also, it also is important to understand that with respect to um, the action that is authorized by private citizens under this act, it's not criminal in nature. It's a civil proceeding in court, as if you were supposed to, like, sue me for anything. But it can, it can actually, your question is a good one. Can, for example, a mother of a daughter that is not happy with the fact that her daughter is going to get an abortion sue the doctor? Absolutely. So if you, you know, I don't know the context of why an insurance company would want to sue anybody. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. No, it seems but the action we've brought against the insurance company. There is no action against an insurance company. The insurance company is not inducing an abortion. An insurance company does not perform an abortion. But it includes anyone who aids and abets. And that includes paying for or reimbursing the cost of the abortion through insurance or otherwise. That's what it says in here. So I'm hoping you can clarify that. Yeah, I, I, just, I just don't see... I, I mean, if, if, if somebody wants to file... I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I'm going to look in, into the future of what the possibilities are. If somebody... Somebody can sue anybody. The realities of litigation is you can sue anybody. If they do end up suing an insurance company, I don't think they're going to prevail. I don't think that's the intent of the statute. I think that if... However, if, if they're going to sue, like you said, the person who drives the person, you know, absolutely that person is subject to a lawsuit under this bill. Or some of the other examples you use, absolutely they're going to be subject to, to civil, civil liability. There are no criminal liabilities in this case. Yes, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, in closing, with our heart and soul, we'd like to thank every person who has stood behind this bill. I'd also like to thank my co-sponsors, Senator Chris Duenas, Senator Amanda Shelton, Senator Tony Yada, and Senator Frank Blas. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to all the, all the local organizations that provide resources for our women and children. Thank you to our foster families, to the parents who have adopted, and to all the family members who have taken in children for making the choice to provide for those in need of a family, in need of love, in need of hope, and the chance to live fulfilling lives. Do you want to clap? <laughs> That's all of you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of those who have sat and continue to sit in prayer consistently for the protection of life. That's my grandmother back there. <laughs> She's always praying for us. And thank you to everyone here today who will help bring the truth to light. It takes a lot of courage and I am honored to work alongside you all. Thank you, Sidus Maasi, and God bless you. Amen.
We will now close this press conference. Thank you very much.